previously on the fan of history. Shalmaneser V became the king of Assyria and Babylonia and King Luli of Tyre was looking for allies to rebel against the Assyrian Empire. Shalmaneser V is the king of the Neo-Assyrian Empire and of Babylonia. We don't have an Assyrian depiction of the king. This is from the Old Testament. He rules Babylonia as King Ululayu. And uh, that is a problem because being the king of Babylonia is a lot of work. So we're talking about the Neo-Assyrian Empire as we have for many episodes. And this is sort of a picture of how big the empire is. I don't fully agree with this map. Uh, you can see the green area in the south to Babylon is the sea land, which is contested by the Chaldeans, but they are currently obeying King Ululayu, that is Shalmaneser V. And there is it, the, the biggest the empire has ever been. But before we talk further about the empire, we, has to, we have to go to the delta of the Nile. Because something happens there in 725 BC. Bakken Ranef becomes the pharaoh of the 24th dynasty. Yeah, that means that his father was Tefnacht. And that must mean that Tefnacht died shortly after his island diplomacy stunt. He survived the great Nubian invasion and didn't even have to submit to Pi. Uh, Bakenranef rules from Saiz in the Western Delta. I think I mentioned in the last episode that he was a commander under his father. There is an Apis stele dated to year 6 of his reign. It's unclear how he can still consider himself pharaoh as Pai just conquered all of Egypt. Uh, he should just have been a great chief of the Libyans or possibly just the prince of Saiz or something. But Manetho, the great Hellenistic scholar that gave us the dynasty system, he gives us two events from Bakenranef's reign. The first event is that the lamb utters a prophecy that Egypt will be conquered by the Assyrians. So actually a lamb does that. It speaks to him and says, oh, this place is going to be conquered by the Assyrians. Well... The second event about Bakken Ranef we will have to talk about in the next episode, or in the 710th episode, because it involves a Wookiee. Uh, Diodorus Sicolus lists Bakken Ranef as one of the six most important lawgivers of ancient Egypt. That's all of ancient Egypt, full 3,000 years of history. And according to Diodorus Siculus, Bakenranef was contemptible in appearance, but wiser than his predecessors. He made a law concerning contracts, which provided for a way to discharge debts when no bond, where no bond was signed. And we are talking here about a minor kinglet in the delta, so this is pretty prominent stuff. Robin Lane Fox observes, perhaps some Greeks unknown to us had close dealings with him, because Bakenranef has this Greek name as well. They found the scarab of Bakenranef at the Ische in the Bay of Naples in Italy in the Greek colony. And Tacitus himself, the famous Roman historian, thought that Bakenranef had a part in the origin of the Jewish nation. Uh -huh. A few stele and that scarab proves that Bakenranef indeed considered himself a pharaoh of Egypt. In Judah, Ahaz is the king, or Jehoahaz. Uh, the Assyrians saved his kingdom. He was going to be destroyed by Israel and Damascus and the Assyrians saved him. And he went to Damascus to pay homage to Tiglath-Peleser in 732 BC. We talked about that. And there he found a nice altar and he was like, oh, this altar is really sweet. And he introduced a copy of it in the temple in Jerusalem. That's not a good idea. Judah is a vassal state of Assyria. And there is a story about Ahaz sacrificing his son to the god Moloch. Mm, pretty bad. The dates are extremely uncertain uh, of his reign, but he will do anything to appease the Assyrians and just uh, remain the king of Judah, vassal to Assyria. Here is the strategic situation for Israel and Judah. Aram Damascus is gone. It's uh, an Assyrian province. 
all the other states in the regions are Assyrian vassals. Uh, most of the Arabs in the desert are also Assyrian vassals, or at least the, the Arabs that Judah comes into contact with. More than half of Israel has been conquered by the Assyrians as an Assyrian province, and the rest is then ruled by Hoshea. He took the throne during the attack of the Assyrians in the 730s, and he also appeased Tiglath Pileser III, but secretly has been looking for allies. He's been talking to the Egyptians and to King Luli of Tyre. Uh, there is an Egyptian pharaoh involved in this, and his name comes down to us as So in the Bible. Uh, the identification among historians is that this was Osorokon IV, and they wanted to shut Assyria out of the Arabo Indian commerce uh, because they, Assyria needed to have Mediterranean ports for this. That's a fairly bad idea then because this is going to make the Assyrians really mad. But now the greatest of all the Assyrians king, uh, Assyrian kings, TP3, is gone and the Shia acts. He stops paying tribute to the Assyrians. Oh, Shalmaneser V is not very happy about this and he moves the Assyrian army in the direction of Israel and this is from the second kings 17 3 to 4 the king of Assyria found conspiracy in Hosea because he sent messengers to So king of Egypt and did not offer the tribute to the king of Assyria as in previous years and as soon as Shalmaneser moves Hosea immediately resumes paying. But he receives um, comforting words from the, this pharaoh then who is probably also Kondo the fourth saying that uh, Egypt is with you. I control all of Egypt. There is nothing going on here in Egypt. I have an enormous army. I'm gonna help you. And that seems like a really brave foreign policy from Osorkon the fourth given what we talked about in the entire last episode when he was involved. And it just doesn't make any sense to me. Why would he be doing this when Pi is just conquering all of Egypt? But Luli and Tyre also says that, uh, well, we're gonna help you. Let's fight it out with this weak new Assyrian king who is not at all like TP3. So Hoshea decides to fight. Uh, there are two versions of the story. In 2 Kings 17.4, it seems that Hoshea is captured by the Assyrians and watches the entire war from Kala, from the Assyrian capital. So he is not in Israel during this war. And one theory is that he actually wants to be in Kala because uh, this tribute situation in Samaria is not, uh, it's not possible. It's not good to be the king of Israel right now. So it's better to be in Assyria, blame everyone else in Israel and watch the Assyrian wrath go down on Israel, but then survive and maybe become the governor of a province instead. Uh, in the other version, Hoshea remains in Samaria and leads the defense of Israel. And there is no mention of any other Israeli leader at this time. But Shalmaneser attacks and he has figured out how everything fits together. And he knows that King Luli is involved somehow. Maybe Hoshea told on King Luli of Tyre. But uh, yeah, the other Phoenician cities will not help Luli. So they pay tribute to Assyria. And they denounce the acts of Tyre. But Tyre proves incredibly hard to capture. The ancient city of Tyre is on an island. It's on the sea. You really need naval forces to conquer it. And Shalmaneser V actually has a navy because the other Phoenician cities provide it. But he still can't conquer Tyre. So he leaves a force in place to besiege the city. And then he marches into Israel. And in 725 BC, Shalmaneser begins besieging Samaria, the capital of Israel. 
And he has then bases very close because the rest of Israel, the north of Israel, is in a Syrian province. There is a prolonged siege. And the Israel's, Israelites really hope that the mighty Egyptian pharaoh will be coming up from the Egypt with Egyptian war chariots and help them. But he is very busy with Pi, so he's not coming. Um, and I, I have such a hard time figuring out. There's another weird thing. I look at the picture of Osirkon IV here. He looks like a Nubian, doesn't he? But he's a Libyan pharaoh. But he wisely stays at home and he is friendly with Pi in the end. So there are now two sieges going on. The Assyrians are besieging Tyre and they are besieging Samaria. And now it's time for sports. In 724 BC we have some news from the Olympics. It's the 14th Olympiad. And a second athletic event was added to the Olympics because the first 13 Olympiads did only have one event. This is the Diaoulos race. It's about 400 meters. You run a double stadium. So you race across the stadium and then you turn around and race back. And scholars have had heated debates whether you had your own turning post. Or if everybody had a common turning post. Mm, exciting stuff. We'll talk a lot more about Greece when we get to part 4 of the 720s BC. The Lelantine War. In 722 BC the siege of Samaria ends. This is it. This is the end of the nation of Israel. And it will not return until 1948. Sargon II, who I have hinted at several times, will try to claim that he was the one who conquered Samaria. But the Babylonian chronicle says Shalmaneser ravaged the city of Shamarar, Shamarain. That sounds like Samaria to me. We also have this eponym chronicle of Assyria where Shalmaneser goes to war against the place for three years, but the name of the place is lost. This is the painting The Fall of Samaria by Don Lawrence in 1964. Uh, so Samaria has fallen and there are now massive deportations of Israelites. And Sargon will claim that he did that. And maybe this time he is a little bit correct. It's possible that there were further deportations and that Sargon did those. So these people that are deported from Israel, they are the lost tribes of Israel. And of the original 12 tribes, only the tribes of Judah and Benjamin remain in the surviving nation of Judah. Because Judah is still around as a vassal state. But Israel or Samaria now becomes a province, now become a province of Assyria and not a vassal state. There are also some members of Levi and the remnant of Simeon. They are also found in Judah. And if you google the lost tribes of Israel you will find some really crazy stuff. Look at this map for example. The Parthian horde under Odin. Uh, they are the lost tribes of Israel. Uh, yeah. Um, you can just... I, I recommend you actually do this. Google the lost tribes of Israel and find all these nutcase theories about the lost tribes. And uh, there's still the legends of the lost tribes of Israel. So when will they come back? Where are they now? So let's go into this. Where did the lost tribes actually go? Here's another nice map. You can see the lost tribes going to Tasmania. And they will now return from Tasmania. But yeah, that's another nutcase theory. So let's look at what serious history can tell us. Well, we can actually look at the Old Testament. Because in 2 Kings 17.6... It says that uh, they went to Assyria and settled them in Hala and Habor, the river of Gosan and the cities of Madai. So let's break this down. Habor, the river of Gosan, this is clearly the region of the upper Habu river, modern Kabur. And uh, on which stood the city of Gusanu, which is modern Tel Halaf, Halaf here on the map. This is in North Syria. 
So some of them went there. They were not all Jews. They, there were a lot of pagans in Israel at this time. But they were all Israelites. Madai is Media. Uh, this is a border region in the Sagros Mountains. The, the Medes have some sort of nation state there. Or maybe as tribal areas. This is a traditional problem area of Assyria. I think we've talked about maybe 20 campaigns of different Assyrian kings going against the Medes. And the Medes will of course still have their time in the sun. You can see the area of the Medes at the east on this map. Hala is less clear. It might have been Halahu. Uh, which appears in the Assyrian inscriptions. This is located to the east of the Tigris and in the general air area of Erbil and Kirkuk in what is today Iraq. Uh, Josephus, the uh, Jewish historian in Roman times, says that the majority of uh, the deported people elected to stay beyond the Euphrates when in the 5th century BC Ezra made known to them Artaxerxes' decree encouraging the return to Jerusalem. Um, because the other people, the Jews of Judah, they will also be deported later by someone else. And they get to return under the decree of the Persian king Artaxerxes in the 5th century. And he also talks to these Jews saying that it's okay to go back to Jerusalem but they don't go back. In reality, there is probably no reason to think that the majority of Jews who remained in the East did other than gradually assimilate to the local populations, uh, the Assyrians and the Babylonians. But if the ten tribes were moved out, who moved in? There is the post-biblical book, book of Tobit, and it describes the adventures of a Jew deported from Israel by Shalmaneser to Nineveh. And that's a bit strange, right? Because Nineveh is not the capital, but maybe Nineveh needed use. And this you had trading relations with other use in media. Uh, there is a presence of use in Assyria following the state. There are Hebrew names in Assyrian sources. For example, Halbishu, a man of Samaria, is mentioned in a letter written from Gusanu and found at Nineveh. Menahem ben Elisha is found in an Aramic script from Kala. Uh, we already talked about this. In Kings, uh, 2 Kings 1724, the king of Assyria settled deportees from Babylonia, Syria and Samaria and other cities of Israel. And you know there were deportees from Babylonia because a lot of the Chaldeans were deported by Tiglath Peleser III and I think Shalmaneser might very well, or Sargon might have moved uh, more Chaldeans into Samaria. This would create a nice mixed population that was more obedient to the Assyrian king. And I won't go there because I, I realize that Israel and talking about the ancient Jews, that will get me a lot of strange comments on this YouTube channel. Actually, I, I run a couple of YouTube channels and no one of my channels receives uh, as much weird comments than this channel. But we are talking serious history here. I'm not an historian. I'm just a fan of history. But uh, yeah. Uh, so I, I'm not going to say anything else. But I wonder where those people, these people that were deported into Israel, where, where are they today? Just think about it. Um, there were probably, as I said, further deportations under Sargon II, and he claims that his, uh, he removed 27,280 Israelites to Assyria, and that probably happened in 720 BC. So what else did the Assyrians do to Israel? Sargon II claims that he rebuilt and enlarged Samaria. He brought in people from conquered territories. There uh, are, have been excavations at Samaria, and there are very clear signs that the Assyrians destroyed Samaria. And no Assyrian buildings have survived in Samaria. And that's probably because they were destroyed during the Hellenistic period. Uh, so what did the forced emigrant, immigrants do in Israel? Well, the new settlers introduced into Israel, Israel set up their own gods. And that's a lot of different gods. So you get Chaldean gods and Babylonian gods and... All kinds of Assyrian gods, old Hittite gods. 
And uh, this activity was no doubt tolerated by the Assyrians. They thought it was great because all gods are really Asher, the god of war. And uh, we have found then that the, the Israelites had, against the teachings of strict Yahvism, then installed statues of various alien gods in Samaria uh, long before this happened. So, yeah, there were a lot of people that, didn't, that weren't used among the Israelites. Because Sargon II counts the gods in whom they trusted amongst the spoils which he takes from defeated cities in Samaria in the next episode. Or in the Seven Tens episodes, we're going to talk about that. Among the gods taken by Sargon II is Nergal himself, the city god of Kutha in Babylonia, clearly showing the presence of defeated Babylonians in Samaria. The presence of settlers from Kuta led the use in later time to refer to the Samar Samaritans, Samaritans as Kutim. The religious pollution of Israel symbolizes perhaps more than anything else its final fall. It's the end of the nation of Israel. And this corruption of religion in Israel then is of course a huge threat to Judah which is now mainly Jewish. Some more archaeology then from this war of Shalmaneser V. Omri's initial capital, Tursa, we talked about that long ago, back in the 880s BC. It shows the building of level 2nd, destroyed by fire at this time. Six miles southeast of Samaria at a place called Sheshem, level 3 is destroyed by fire at this time. Tirsa and Sheshem probably fell to the Assyrians before Samaria, because Samaria held out for three years. Further north, north at Hasor, the destruction of level 5 is attributed to Shalmaneser V. Level 4 immediately afterwards have crude buildings probably built by surviving Israelites. And level 3 of Hasor has a massive Assyrian fortress. Around this time, the Assyrians, in, Assyrians invented the postal system. I think this was done by Tiglath Peleser III because it seems like one of the things he would do. The first credible claim for the development of real postal system comes from ancient Persia. The point of invention remains in question. And the first documented claim by Xenophon attributed it to Cyrus the Great, king of Persia in 550 BC. Oh, I want to talk about that guy. But other sources claim a much earlier date for an Assyrian postal system. And some even say that Hammurabi, back in 1700 BC, invented this. And Sargon II also claims that he, it was him. And the year 722 BC, so it might have been Shalmaneser V, it might have been Sargon, it might have been Tiglath Peleser III. But we will talk more about Sargon II very soon. And of course, mail might not have been the primary mission of the Assyrian postal system. Because this was an intelligence gathering apparatus. And it is actually documented as that. There is a lot of Assyrian mail preserved. Uh, written on mud bricks, I think. Or on mud, yeah, in you know, clay tablets. The system was later called Angaria. Which, uh, came, which means that it was a tax system. We've already seen the Assyrian aqueducts, we've seen them inventing cavalry and they will now go on an invention spree. So you will marvel at the things that the Assyrians invent before their empire fall in 612 BC. So 722 BC, Shalmaneser V dies and this death is pretty mysterious. We know there were some problems in Babylon and remember that Shalmaneser V, as King Ululayu of Babylon, he had to perform all the duties of the Babylonian king. But he wasn't in Babylon, he was in Israel, so he couldn't do it. So they, the Babylonians were probably upset. And of course he deported Babylonians to Israel, so that probably did not make him uh, popular. But our source for this... Um, the reason we don't have a source for how Shalmaneser died, okay, of course they never tell us how they died. He probably died in Israel, or maybe he was assassinated. But our source then is of course Sargon II. 
and we will talk a lot about him in the 710s episode because he now takes the Assyrian kingship. Uh, so first the name is epic because Sargon the Great of Akkad is one of the most fascinating figures in ancient history and he built the Akkadian Empire long, long before the Assyrians, or before the Neo-Assyrian Empire at least, long ago. Uh, and the Assyrians look up to this guy and they like to consider him the first Assyrian king, but he wasn't really an Assyrian. There is an Assyrian king called Sargon I. It's a common misconception that Sargon II calls himself Sargon II because Sargon the Great was the first Sargon, but he wasn't. There was a Sargon I of Assyria who ruled maybe from 1920 BC to 1881 BC. And all we know about this Sargon I character is that he refortified the ancient capital of Ashur. But that's an entirely different era than this one. The name Sargon, or Surukinu, I think is the real name, means true king, or the king is legitimate. That means that, I think, this guy is an usurper. He will claim to be the son of Tiglath Pileser III and the brother of Shalmaneser V. But I believe, like Tiglath Pileser himself, that Sargon is a usurper. And uh, it's if your dad was the Assyrian himself, Tiglas Pelleser III. Wouldn't you talk about him? Remember how Shalmaneser III talked about Ashurnasipal II all the time. But Sargon II almost never mentions any other Assyrian king. So I think there is a, a very real chance that he's a usurper. And... Uh, uh, said most of these things before but he had many things to attend to so he didn't have time to go to Babylonia and reclaim the kingship and remember the Babylonians were not pleased with how Shalmaneser V had handed the kingship this guy though Sargon II is one of the great kings if I get back to making the tribute videos to the great Assyrian kings of course Tiglath Pileser will receive one but Sargon II will also do that because he will do a lot of things he's involved in many many things uh, but he will do two things that no other Assyrian king ever did he will discuss the details of a battle remember the Assyrians never told us what they did in actual fighting and he will also be killed in action no other Assyrian king that I know of is ever killed on the field of battle which is really strange because they go to battle all the time and what enemy could possibly do this? Who could kill an Assyrian king? Uh, we'll talk about that in the 710s BC. And we'll actually talk more about Sargon II in the 710s BC. And I will leave everything, even what he did in 721 BC and 720 BC, to the 710s episode. In the power vacuum in Babylon then, uh, the Chaldean prince of Bityakin claims the kingship he paid homage to tp3 and uh, became the king of the sea land but now while the assyrians are distracted he seizes all of the power and he has some help he will gather an impression collection of allies because everybody hates the assyrians he has many names and I, I've chosen to go with Merodach Baladan because that's his biblical name because he's also in the Old Testament. But he's also known as Marduk Apli Adina II, Marduk Baladan, Baladan or Berodach Baladan. And he will prove to be one of the greatest arch enemies of Assyria ever. Well... Pi dies at some point, and it might be 722 BC or 1716 BC. He was the first king of the 25th dynasty. We talked about him all of last episode. He was a strong and powerful ruler of Egypt and Nubia. He is buried in Nubia, not in Egypt, at El Kuru, near Jebel Barkal. This pyramid is his tomb. His body had been placed on a bed which rested in the middle of the chamber. And his four favorite horses were buried nearby. 
And this is the place where the kings of the 25th dynasty will be buried. And his brother Shubaka takes the throne of Egypt and Nubia. So maybe the lords of the delta must now consider if they will really stand for this. Will they obey the Nubians? Will they let the Nubians have their 25th dynasty or not? So what about poor Judah? Ahaz obviously bet on the right horse because he has been loyal to the Assyrians. But he is a vassal kingdom of Assyria. Now everyone else is a vassal kingdom or a province. And the Jews of Israel are gone. The only Jews in the area remain in Judah. And Tyre is still under siege. So Tyre is the only kingdom resisting Assyria. Oh wait! Tyre, the siege in Tyre ended. And Luli does a great trick here. Uh, it's not known what actually happened. But Luli remains in power. And given all that he had done against Shalmaneser V, he should have been punished. But he is he's there. He is a vassal now to the Assyrians. But Tyre never falls to the Assyrian siege. So imagine how hard this place must be to besiege. Because it's not often that the Assyrians fail and don't come back and finish it. The other Phoenician states are of course loyal vassals to Assyria. And that, as I said before, it means now that the Assyrians have a navy in the Mediterranean manned by Phoenicians. Okay, everyone else is a vassal state and Judah is now feeling pretty bad about the situation. So Judah might be in danger. We got news from China! It's the first news we have for 56 years, I think. I think I haven't talked about China uh, for 56 years in this show. King Ping, who has ruled since 776 BC, is dead. And he was clearly a puppet ruler controlled by the nobles of China. He's succeeded by King Huan. And King Ping has ruled so long that his crown prince has died. So King Huan is the grandson of King Ping. His given name was Lin and he's now the king of Yu China. Next time we will learn and the world will learn who Sargon II really is. You can discuss the show with me on YouTube or on Facebook. Check out our Facebook page. Check out our uh, Final History WordPress com site. Uh, the biggest thing there is the full script for the timeline of the world history episodes, and that's some great writing by Shane Sorisby. So check that out. Uh, you can also support the show, and we are trying to get to thirty dollars per episode on Patreon.com. So if you feel like you want to contribute anything, maybe twenty-five cents an episode. Uh, you can do that and we're, real, we're really trying to get to $30 because if we get to $30 uh, I can now justify before my wife <laughs> and the forces that be that uh, I can keep doing this uh, for the whole of the 7th century BC. And the 7th century BC is an amazing time including the spectacular fall of the Neo-Assyrian Empire in 612 BC. But the empire will also grow much bigger than it is now under Sargon II. So uh, stay tuned and thank you for watching.